Well, this morning, as I've already told you, we are going to look at just one verse. I've already read the text, but let me just read the one verse we're looking at uh, again. And that is verse 37 of Matthew 22, when the uh, lawyer asked him the question, Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Now, as I've already mentioned this morning, we're returning to the subject of spiritual warfare, what we've been looking at over the past several Lord's Days. And again, are being reminded that as believers, we, we have enemies. Um, sometimes Christianity is portrayed a bit differently than that. It's, it's like, come to Jesus and all your troubles will be over. You know, come to Jesus and everybody's going to love you. And we, we know if we've been with the Lord Jesus very long that that isn't necessarily the case. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells it, it will be otherwise. The devil will come against us before we are in his kingdom, before we knew Jesus and everything was going well and he was happy to have us there. He wasn't fighting against us. He was keeping us happy. Uh, that was, is something that we began to experience when we came to Christ and certainly our flesh before we were just doing what our flesh wanted to do, what the sin inside of us desired. But now we're crossing it because we have a love for the Lord. So it comes against us. And of course, the two of them essentially use the world to tempt us to sin. Now, the devil and the flesh we know have the same purpose. That purpose is to destroy us if they could. But if we belong to Jesus, they know they cannot destroy us. So they want to cripple us since they can't destroy us. And we also noted that, that both of them most often use the same bait to try to get us to fall into sin. They use the world around us. If we can fall into, if he can get us to tempt us to sin, to get us to fall into sin, then that will grieve the Spirit of God who is within us. If the Spirit of God is grieved, it will weaken the love that is in us. If that love is weakened, it will weaken the faith that the Lord has given to us. Now, so far, we've seen a few of the ways that the devil attempts to do this. And again, when I'm talking about the devil, the devil's working with our flesh, often through the world. But I use these terms somewhat synonymously because they both have the same tendency and the same goal. But they attack the Word of God. They try to change what the Word of God says. They try to add to it, try to take away from it um, to lead us into sin. Just think about the cults. What's wrong with the cults? Well, they've taken away from the Word of God some of the essentials of the gospel we need to believe to be saved. That destroys the soul. Now, we may not be necessarily in, in danger of that, but we may be in danger of changing the word in other ways, and there are many ways in which that could take place, and I'd refer you back to that sermon uh, to think about that. But he attacks the word. Now, if he can't change the word literally, like he does, again, within the cults, adding their additional works and so forth and really depreciating the Bible, then he'll try to change the way we look at the word as, again, with Eve, trying to convince us, as he did Eve, that what God says not to do, we should do. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And that the bad things we shouldn't do, we should really do because they're good. He'll turn these things around and get us to look at them differently so that we'll fall into sin and disobey him and grieve the Spirit of God. He attacks our view of God, what we think of God, uh, how God reveals himself in the creations. He tries to hide his glory. Again, think evolution. What, what is it that evolutionists do? They, they want to attribute all this, uh, which is an expression of God's wisdom and power, they want to attribute it to, to just pure random chance or just a cosmic accident. They are hiding the glory of God. Satan is behind that. The flesh is behind that. And of course, Satan also wants to hide the beauty of God in his holiness, which we see in his word, his love for what is good his grace and his mercy. Satan does not want our love to be fueled by these things because if, if it isn't, then we will grow spiritually weaker. So he tries to keep us out of the Bible. And of course, he also attacks our assurance. If Satan can convince us that God doesn't love us, that God hasn't saved us, he can get us so caught up into pursuing our, our own salvation that we don't spend time reaching out to others because we're really unsure of ourselves. And of course, if we reach out to try to 
bring others to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that will weaken his kingdom, and he doesn't want that. So he tries to get us to become introspective. Now, today, I want us to consider another attack of Satan, and that is his suggestion, and it's all over, and we've experienced it ourselves, that we do not need, really, to love God to the degree that Jesus tells us that we need to in the passage we've just read, nor exactly the way that he tells us that we need to love him. Now, that's a huge subject, so this morning we're just going to look at the first point. Now, there shouldn't be any question in our minds how much Jesus loved his Father while he was on the earth, okay? And we know he still loves him in heaven. He loves him with his whole heart, with his whole being. And Jesus kept his word to the letter. Everything he did was based squarely upon the Scriptures. And there also shouldn't be any question as to why Jesus did this, because that was his nature, because that was his heart, because he was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure, and it protected him because his heart was so inflamed with his holy love. But he also did this so that he might make us like him, so that Jesus, as Paul tells us, might be the firstborn, that is the one who has the preeminence, among many brethren, many brothers and sisters who share that same nature, who share that same image. Well, that is what the Bible teaches, but we know that Satan would tell us otherwise. Our flesh would tell us that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, they would tell us, essentially, your love for God, our love for God, isn't really the issue. It's God's love for you. God loves you. He wants you to be safe. So he sent his son to die for you. And now that you've trusted him, and now that you're safe, and now that you're on your way to heaven, that's all that God really cares about. Because God doesn't need your love. You need his love, but he doesn't need your love. He's perfectly happy as he is. He's perfectly happy already. He just wants you to be happy. That's why he made the world, so you could be happy. That's why he saved you, so you could be secure so you could enjoy yourself more in this world. As a matter of fact, he will tell you, you really don't even need to worship the Lord. He doesn't need you to worship him. You don't need to worship him either because you already know everything that the pastor is going to say this morning. You're already saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. You already know what the Bible says about how you are to live. Doesn't the Bible itself teach you that you don't need anyone to teach you anything because you have the anointing? You can just stay at home and read your Bible. You don't have to come to church. But if you should decide to go to church, make sure that you go to those places that are, are fun, fun to go to, that have the kind of music that you enjoy singing, the kind that basically are, give you the, the self-help kind of sermons that make you feel better about yourself, uh, that make the Christian life easier to live, that allow you to have more of the world and still go to heaven. Don't go to those places where they're going to throw a wet blanket on your joy and on your plans by talking about duty or self-sacrifice or the fact that you need to love God with everything that's in you. Be a Christian, but don't overdo it. Don't stand out too much because if you do, you're not going to fit in. You're not going to fit into this world. You're not going to fit into society. You're not going to fit into the places where you're working. You're not going to have any friends. I mean, think about those who actually do what Jesus is talking about here. How weird they are. How out of step with everyone else. How gloomy. How precise, perhaps. How picky. If you take these things too seriously, you might actually lose your job. You know, there's a lot of places that aren't going to tolerate you if you stand on principle, particularly if you will not work on Sundays. If you're not politically correct enough, you might even end up in jail, and Christians are not politically correct. So Satan would say, it's not worth it. Keep your Christianity to yourself. You don't have to be an open, you know, you come out of the closet sort of Christian. You can be like Joseph of Arimathea. Wasn't he a, a secret believer? I mean, he's the one who kept his belief secretly, you know, secret so that the Pharisees wouldn't persecute him. You can still go to heaven and have a lot less trouble getting there 
he says, if you will only listen to me. Now, that is the kind of Christianity that the devil likes. That's the kind of Christianity that he promotes. And this is the kind that our flesh loves too because they know that if we buy into this, it will cripple us and take away any threat that we might pose to his kingdom. Now, we need to refute this lie because this is a lie of the enemy. This is not what the Lord tells us to do. We need to take a good look at what Jesus is saying in our passage this morning. Because what does he tell us about how much we are to love him? What kind of devotion is he looking for? What kind of commitment does he want? Well, he wants everything, doesn't he? He wants everything that we have to give. And that's actually what this, this passage means when he says in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus is telling us here that we are to love the Father, we are to love Him. And by the way, when we're talking about the Lord our God, we're talking about Yahweh, covenant God of Israel, and He is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's talking about loving all three persons. But Jesus is telling us that we need to love the Father, we need to love Him, we need to love the Spirit of God with all that we have to love, with all of our affections, with all of the powers of our minds, our, our reasoning power, our imaginations, with our whole soul. The soul is essentially that animating uh, principle within us that gives us life. We are to love him with our whole life. And Mark adds to this that we are to love him with all of our strength. And he doesn't necessarily specify what kind of strength, so I think we should assume. With all of our emotional strength, our physical strength, and our spiritual strength and energy. Everything we can muster, we are to focus it all upon him. Now, Jesus goes on to say that this, along with the love that we are to show our neighbor, sums up all the moral requirements of the entire Old Testament. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what is the Old Testament trying to teach us? You know, maybe you're confused if you read through it and you read about all the things going on. What is this all about? It essentially boils down to what Jesus says in verse 40. On these two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, depend the whole law and the prophets. This is what they were teaching. So what Jesus is telling us here is this, that we are saved by grace through faith alone. We are certainly not saved by our works, not by doing these things, loving God and loving our neighbor. We can't love God and love our neighbor apart from the grace of God. But he is telling us this, that the faith that he gives to us as a free gift. The faith that actually saves us is a faith that transforms us. It's the Spirit of God working in us, working his nature in us, working the nature of Jesus in us. The Spirit of God comes into our souls and according to the Old Testament, breaks up that heart of stone which doesn't beat for the Lord, it's rock hard, into a heart of flesh which does beat for the Lord so that we can and will love him and our neighbor in this way. Not perfectly, but this is the direction that we'll be moving. Uh, Augustine once summarized this whole thing in a short prayer. I'm sure you've heard this before. He prayed, Lord, command what you will. I mean, you're the Lord. You can, you can tell me to do whatever you want, and I know that what you're going to tell me to do is good. But then he goes on to say, and give what you command. Whatever you command, Lord, I can't do it in my own strength, so whatever you want me to do, please give me the strength to do it as well. And that's exactly what the Lord promises that he will give us, the spirit of power and love. As a matter of fact, this is the blessing of the new covenant. And again, I just want to remind us that you know when we're contrasting the old covenant, remember the author to the Hebrews, which is when he's quoting Jeremiah 31, is talking about what the problem was with the Mosaic Covenant as it was considered in and of itself. And the problem was this, that when you write down the law on stone tablets and you show that to God's people, that's not going to help them do it. They'll read it and they'll realize, okay, Lord, you can command what you will, but I can't do that. That was the whole reason why God gave the law, to show them they couldn't do it. And as a matter of fact, most of them didn't do it. And so the Lord then promises to make a new covenant in which he's going to fix the problem. The problem is the heart problem. 
The second part of that petition or that prayer of Augustine, give what you command. That is what he gives in the new covenant. We read in Hebrews 8 verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. By the way, when he says I'm going to do this to the house of Israel, we do need to realize that the church, new covenant believers are enjoying the blessings of, that were meant for Israel. You know, the, the, the apostles and the early disciples were were Jewish because this was meant for them. And as it spread out through the world, the Gentiles came in and we've been grafted into the same tree. So what he's talking about here is what we are enjoying today. Now before, when God gave us the tablets of stone, we were duty bound to obey those commandments, even without the grace of God. That's, that's our obligation. But in the new covenant, it is our pleasure to obey those commandments because of his grace, because he has changed our hearts. He's written the law of God on our hearts. Now, we know that God gave this blessing even in the Old Testament, even under the Mosaic Covenant, even before the Mosaic Covenant. The cross of Christ and its effects went both directions, into the past and into the future, thankfully, because we're future, we're we're beyond that actual event. But we see its effects reverberating in both directions. I mean, look in the Old Testament. You don't have to look very far until you find people who loved the Lord in this way. Enoch loved God and walked with God, and God was so pleased with him that he took him at the early age of 300 and something, when he could have lived to be 900 and something. You know, sometimes we think a short life is a curse. Enoch considered it to be a blessing because he got to go to be in the presence of the Lord. Abraham's love, we know, for the Lord was so great that when God called him to sacrifice his son, his only son, he willingly did it. Although we do remember that he was looking at what God had promised through Isaac, your seed shall be called. Abraham knew that if he sacrificed his son, God would raise him up again. But Abraham loved him so much he was willing to do that and to trust God that he would raise up his son. Moses, as we know, turned his back on Egypt, and we can only imagine what that would have been like because Egypt was the best thing going in those days, at least from the world's perspective. They had the treasures, they had the pleasures, they had everything, and he gave it all up in order to suffer. He gave it up to suffer as God's deliverer, and the reason he did was because he loved God and because he was looking to the reward that was ahead of him. And the ultimate reward is that you get to be with God in heaven and see him face to face. Paul's a great example in the New Testament of the grace of God working in our lives. He was the one who was the Pharisee of the Pharisees trying to destroy the church. He was the foremost prosecutor or persecutor of the church. And the grace of God changed him into the church's foremost defender. He gave up everything that he had accomplished in his life. And he suffered more than than any other believer has suffered. I mean, even martyrdom because of his love for Jesus. He writes in Philippians 3, verse 8. And Philippians 3 is essentially a good portion of his testimony. He says, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. As we look through the, the, uh, you know, look back basically over the quarters of church history on this side of the cross, what is it that strikes you about the people you admire most during that time frame? You know, I, I talk about Jonathan Edwards quite a bit, and I appreciate his ability to understand the Bible and to be able to explain it and apply it. But the other thing that stands out to me about Edwards is his love for the Lord. He loved the Lord. And he made some huge sacrifices based upon that love. And I think if we look at Whitfield and Wesley and Spurgeon and others, we'll see that they all shared that in common. They all loved the Lord like Jesus. And the reason was because they had his spirit living in them. And if we have his spirit within us, we will do the same. We will love the Lord most of all. Now, we're not going to love him perfectly, as I've said. And we will fail many, many times. 
but that will be our desire. You know, some people read this, um, this passage, and I've, I've talked to people like this in the past, and they believe that what the Lord is actually calling us to do here really amounts to nothing more than simply committing ourselves to do the right things, not, not to love the Lord as though it's kind of an emotional thing or an affectional thing, but rather it's, it's a committal sort of thing where I'm committing myself to do the right thing. Love is right action. It doesn't really involve the heart, in other words. Well, it certainly involves our actions, but it also involves our hearts because without the right heart, without the heart in it, it is unacceptable to God. Remember the Pharisees. They did a lot of right things, maybe not as many as, well, certainly not as many as they should. But they did do right things. They were the teachers of the law. They knew at least something of what the law said. They were wrong at many points. But they did these things, and yet what they did was not acceptable to God. And the reason why it wasn't is because, he says, they, they honor me with their lips and perhaps with their lives, but their hearts are far from me. That's why it is not pleasing. Paul tells us that even our greatest sacrifices mean nothing to God without love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. How can we say that love is merely right action? We can make the greatest sacrifices without love. It means nothing to God. God is looking at the heart. He's looking at the motive. What is it that's motivating us to do the things that we're doing? It needs to be love. What is love? Well, it's one of those things that perhaps is hard to explain. It, it is an affection. It's a yearning, a yearning of soul, a strong desire to please, a delight in serving because we want to, because we have to. We're compelled to do it. We are thrilled to be able to do it. Some would say it's like going bananas over something. It's, it's a very strong emotion that compels you to please the object of that love. Now, without love, what we do, as I've already mentioned, is not only unacceptable. Jesus tells us that it actually turns his stomach. And this is something that is perhaps one of the hard sayings of Jesus, but it's, it's in the scriptures, so we have to deal with it. He says to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. And again, I know your deeds, but also know what's going on in your heart. You're not cold and you're not hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarmness doesn't measure up to what it is that the Lord wants to see in us. He wants to see heat. He wants to see fervency. He wants to see zeal. He wants to see this in our worship, in our private worship. He wants to see it in, uh, when we're in private with him, when nobody is looking, pouring out our souls to him because we love him, seeking him in his word. When... Uh, we're together in public. He wants us to love him so that we can encourage one another to do the same. He wants to see this love in our relationships with each other, to love one another, to devote ourselves to each other as though we are family because, as a matter of fact, we are family. We are members of the same body. And he wants to see love for the lost, I mean, think about Jesus' attitude uh, as we describe his love toward the Father, his love toward his people, and his love toward the lost. Uh, think about Jesus' heart for the lost sheep. It was continually drawing him out to minister to Israel, to gather them in. Think about Paul's desire to reach out to the Gentiles. As Jesus said on one occasion, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. They have to come as well. Well, Paul was out there gathering those sheep together. But think about how much they gave themselves to reach them. Paul writes to Titus, and as I read this, think about whether this isn't a definition of love, even though I don't think the word actually occurs here. He says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, 
and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory and uh, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his work of love, was to do a work of love in our hearts so that we would be zealous for God. Now, the Lord has given us this love by his Holy Spirit. It, he already, you know, it already dwells in us. We've already been changed. We already have this new nature. That's why we have the struggle that's going on in us to try to do what's right because we want to do what's right. But we also know there's work that we need to do because this growing in love is, is not something that happens automatically. It requires uh, fighting. It requires struggling. We need to fight to put off the things we should not be doing, and we need to struggle to put on Christ, to be putting on the things that we should be doing, the things that he calls us to do, and that's actually what we're going to be looking at this evening. And we need to use the means of grace. Remember the means of grace, uh, reading the Word of God and prayer and those things that we talk about. If we don't use those things, if we don't seek the Lord through those things, if we don't ask for greater love, if we don't, you know, basically read the scriptures to learn more about God, to see him and pray that God would reveal his glory to us in his word, we're not going to grow stronger. We also need to spend time in worship and in fellowship. Now, if we devote ourselves to these things, and that's what we will do to some degree, if we have the spirit working that desire in our hearts, if we devote ourselves to these things, we will grow in love, and we will grow in devotion. But let me just mention Satan, as I've already may have mentioned before, and probably have on numerous occasions. He's going to do everything he can. Your flesh is going to do everything it can to keep you away from these things so that you will not grow stronger. So he's going to try to keep you away because he knows it's going to have a profound impact in your lives. He knows it's going to strengthen you. He doesn't want you to be strong, so he's going to work against you. The flesh knows these things will weaken it and put it to death, so it's going to try to keep you away from it. But if you do overcome them and get into these things, you will grow in love. Not only will you become more pleasing to the one who gave himself for us, you will also become his means of taking down the enemy's kingdom. You can't do that if you're indifferent. You can't do that if you don't love the Lord. You can't do that if you're not convinced you need to do that. You won't do that if you're not convinced you're saved. He's trying to do everything he can to keep you from confronting his kingdom as our Lord has called you to do. But if you do these things, if you put him first, if you grow in love, you will do what the Lord calls you to do you will threaten his kingdom and people will be saved. Well, may the Lord give us, uh, again, grace to put him first and may he help us to grow in our love. Now, one of the means that the Lord has given to us to help us grow in grace is the Lord's Supper. And we're going to be celebrating that in just a few moments. So as we think about how indebted we are to the Lord, how much we should love him, let's remember what he did for us that he gave us his son, that which was most precious to him, in order that he might suffer hell for us on the cross so that we might go free and that we might be forgiven and that we might be reconciled to him and that we might be made his children. Think about the love of God and how that calls you to love him in the way that we see we're called to love him this morning. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?